The gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hicks, let me start by acknowledging how riveting your testimony was at the events of that day and evening and thanking you for your service and your activity, for sharing with us all the brave acts that, uh, that occurred that night. I don't think we have heard enough of that. Uh, and I think it is important for the American people to know how many individuals, both in Tripoli and in Libya, responded so very well and bravely on that. So thank you for sharing that and for your service as well. Uh, you know, we have an important responsibility here, and that is to ensure that whatever happened that night and whatever we learned from what could have been done better actually gets fixed. And I think that is a legitimate process for this committee to do. I hope uh, we move on on that basis. I know that you know, we had uh, accountability review boards set up immediately in the wake of all of this, uh, and they were rather harsh in their determination on that. And in fact, they made some 29 different recommendations uh, on that. And uh, we should be finding out whether or not the Secretary of State and the Department are implementing those recommendations and how expeditiously. And I hope that at some point uh, we can get to that, which I think would be the appropriate role for the, for the government. And I know that, that uh, two of the three witnesses here this, uh, this morning actually spoke with the Accountability Review Board, and the third certainly knew of his right to, uh, to speak and, and chose not to contact them for, for whatever reason on that. But earlier this week, I think disturbingly, you know, the Chairman went on to national television and actually accused the administration of deliberately misleading the American people about the attacks in Benghazi. Uh, for you know, somebody that has earned a, a, the term of being a whopper, making a statement of a whopper and four Pinocchios, it is a little bit uh, shocking to think that that kind of a statement would be made without any apparent backup. The basis for the extreme charge were apparently uh, statements made by Ambassador Rice on news shows the Sunday after the attacks. And the, the comments were allegedly uh, that talking points were provided by the intelligence community were supposedly manipulated for political purposes. Uh, what was quoted by the chairman at that uh, TV show is clearly the American public was deliberately misled, uh, said the Whopper, uh, uh, and it was a political decision, close quote. Mr. Hicks, you told our investigators that you weren't involved with the drafting of those talking points. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. And Mr. Nordstrom, you weren't involved either. Is that correct? No, I was not. And Mr. Thompson, you also were not involved. Is that right? Uh, yes, Congressman. But, however, I offered my services to the ARB, and, and uh, I, I did not try to keep myself out of that process, just for the record. Good. Thank you. Uh, and we know that there were conflicting reports about what happened, uh, including a statement by a Libyan, a Libyan official that there had been a demonstration in some eyewitness accounts of that protest. Uh, but, Mr. Hicks, we know that you didn't believe that there was a protest. You believed that, that it was otherwise. And we know that the President of Libya also contradicted uh, with that statement on that. But the intelligence community insisted it received initial reporting suggesting there was a demonstration. We know that the reporting was wrong. Now we know that. Uh, but the mention of a demonstration was put into talking points by the intelligence committee, not the White House or the State Department. So I want to play a little video here, if we can, of General Clapper, where he specifically addresses the attacks on Ambassador Rice. If we have that queued up. And when she was highly criticized for following them, what was your feeling inside? Your own personal belief. Did you think it was fair that she be criticized? Well, I thought it was. Uh, I thought it was unfair because, uh, um, you know, the hits she took. I, I didn't think that was uh, appropriate. And, and she was going on what we had given her, and um, th that was our our collective best judgment at the time as to what what what, what should have been said. Thank you. So. General Clapper says that he thinks the attacks on Ambassador Rice were unfair. She was using exactly what the intelligence community gave her. Mr. Hicks, uh, do you uh, have an argument with his veracity when he made those statements? There was no report from the U.S. mission in Libya of a demonstration. On uh, the difficult question I have for you, because you are good enough to come forward, is uh, do you contest the uh, General Clapper's veracity? Is he, is he lying or is he telling the truth of what, he, what information he gave Ambassador Rice? I don't know anything about the development of those talking points. Okay. So, look, we, we haven't investigated this issue yet. You know, it would be interesting to know, but the House Intelligence Committee has. They got all of the draft talking points. They got the briefings and testimony from CIA officials. According to Adam Schiff, one of the representatives that is on uh, and part of that investigation, he said, I quote, General Petraeus, the former head of the CIA, made it clear that the change was made to protect classified sources of information, not to spin it, not to politicize it, 
and it wasn't done at the direction of the White House. Uh, and we might, as an aside, we might be interested in protecting classified information because we've had situations where people in the, in the majority have gone to Libya and come back and had a real flare-up about what they disclosed concerning classified information. Uh, but in addition, there was a bipartisan report issued by Senator Lieberman and Senator Collins that similarly stated, and I quote, no changes were made for political reasons and there was no attempt to mislead the American people about what happened in Benghazi. So people who have actually seen the documents, who have actually conducted a real investigation, completely reject the allegation that they were made for political purposes or to deliberately mislead the American people. And with that, I yield Thank back. Thank you, Mr. Tierney. Um, let me yield now to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hicks, in your 22 years of service to our country, you have always received good reviews, strong evaluations. Is that accurate? Yes, sir. And as I look, I mean, I am just a country boy from Ohio, but as I look at your resume and bio, other than, uh, other than deg the, the degrees from Michigan, it is uh, it's, it's impressive. It is amazing the things you have done. And in fact, immediately after the attacks, everybody said you did a great job. Right? I mean, you look at the, the addendum here. Wendy Sherman said you did an outstanding job. Bill Burns, Deputy Secretary of State, great work, heroic efforts. You got a phone. Isn't it true, Mr. Hicks? I think you cited this in your, in your opening statement. It, it, the Secretary Clinton gave you a call immediately after the tax and said you did an outstanding job under extreme circumstances? Yes, sir. We had uh, the first call at 2 a.m. and then again a video conference with our staff. And isn't it also true the President of the United States called you up and said, you know what, Mr. Hicks, you did an outstanding job again under severe circumstances? He did call me, sir. And all that seems to change. You are getting all this praise and support, but all that seems to change, and it seems to change in the phone call you were on that Mr. Gowdy referenced in his questioning, the phone call he got from Beth Jones. Is that accurate? Yes. At a phone call after the interview, I asked. This is after Secretary Rice has went on to television and misled the American people. You are on a phone call with Beth Jones, and it all seems to change then because you asked, Mr. Uh, you asked Beth Jones what? I asked her why the ambassador had said there was a demonstration when the embassy had reported only an attack. And again, what kind of response did you get from Beth Jones when you asked that question? She said, I don't know. Was, but was, was it like you shouldn't be asking that question, you should be quiet, we don't want to talk about that? What, 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 what was the sense you got? The sense I got was that I needed to stop the line of questioning. And did things continue to deteriorate between you and your superiors? After they've given you all this praise, you've had this outstanding service record, 22 years serving our country things begin to deteriorate even more. And as I read the transcript, it seems to me that it came to a head in phone calls you were on with lawyers from the Department of State prior to Congressman Chaffetz coming to visit in Libya. Is that accurate? Yes, sir. And tell me about those conversations, what those lawyers instructed you to do on Mr. Chaffetz's visit to Libya. I was instructed not to allow the RSO the Acting Deputy Chief of Mission and myself to be personally interviewed by Congressman Chaffetz. So the people at State told you don't talk to the guy who is coming to investigate? Yes, sir. Said don't Not talk with the Congressman? Now, you have had, you've had several congressional delegations come to various places you have been around the world. Has that ever happened where lawyers get on the phone to you prior to a congressional delegation coming to investigate a time when we have had four Americans lose their lives? Have you ever had anyone tell you don't talk with the people from Congress coming to find out what took place? Never. Never. And you have had dozens and dozens of congressional delegations that you have been a part of? Yes, sir. First time it has ever happened? Yes, sir. Tell me about, and, and also, is, isn't it true that one of those lawyers on the phone call accompanied the folks on the delegation and, and tried to be in every single meeting you had with Mr. Chaffetz and the delegation from this committee? Yes, sir. That is true. Tell me what happened when you got a classified briefing with Mr. Chaffetz, what happened and the phone call that happened after that? The lawyer was excluded from the meeting because his clearance was not, was not high enough and the delegation had insisted that the briefing not be limited by any... Did the lawyer try to get in that briefing? He tried, yes, but the uh, annex chief and, and uh, would not allow it because the briefing needed to be at the appropriate level of clearance. And you, you had a subsequent conversation after this classified briefing that the lawyer was not allowed to be in with you and Mr. Chaffetz and others on that delegation. And you had a, another conversation on the phone with Cheryl Mills. Tell me who is Cheryl Mills? She was counselor for the Department of State and chief of staff to Secretary Clinton. That is a pretty important position? Yes, sir. When she calls, you take the phone call? That's immediately. 
Yeah, she's, she's, she's the fixer for the Secretary of State. She is as close as you can get to Secretary Clinton. Is that accurate? Yes, sir. And tell me about that phone call you had with Cheryl Mills. Uh, a phone call from that senior person is, generally speaking, not considered to be good news. And what did she have to say to you? Uh, she in demanded a report on the visit. Was she upset by the fact that this lawyer was not, this, this was upset. babysitter, this spy, whatever you want to call him, was not allowed to be in that? First time it's ever happened, all the, all the congressional delegations you've ever entertained was not allowed to be in that classified briefing. Was she upset about that fact? She was very upset. So this goes right to the person next to Secretary Clinton. Is that accurate? Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, here's a guy with 22 years of outstanding service to our country. 22 years outstanding service, praised by everybody who counts, the President, the Secretary, everyone above him, and yet now they're obstructing it because he won't, he won't help them cover this up. He's an honorable man here telling the truth, now is getting this kind of treatment from the very people who praised him before. This is why this hearing is so important. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, pleased to yield now to the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Clay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for yielding. And, uh, I want to thank the witnesses for being here today. You know, the uh, Accountability <coughs> Review Board made a number of recommendations to better strengthen overseas embassies and missions like the one in Benghazi. Uh, Mr. Nordstrom, you told our staff that you read the ARB's unclassified report and recommendations. Do you think that implementing these recommendations is important to ensure the safety and security of our foreign service? Absolutely. I had an opportunity to uh, review that along with the other two uh, committee reports. I think taken all together, they are fairly comprehensive and reasonable. And, 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 and I guess um, a, a uh, diplomat like you probably feels very disheartened. Uh, when you read in the paper, say you're overseas and Congress has cut this budget for embassy security and Congress has been cheap, on the cheap, of uh, providing protection uh, to our, our personnel. You know, in order to, to, to make security possible uh, at our missions and our embassies throughout the world, it's one recommendation in this report that attempts to grapple with these issues and err on the side of increased attention to prioritization and the fuller support for people and facilities engaged in working in high-risk, high-threat areas. The solution requires a more serious and sustained commitment from Congress to support State Department needs needs, which in total constitute a small percentage, both of the full national budget and that spent for national security. But it is exactly what we in Congress have failed to do in the past. Uh, Let us look at our record. House Republicans voted to cut the administration's request for embassy security funding by $128 million. And that was in fiscal year 2011. In fiscal year 2012, they cut the request by even more, providing $331 million less than requested. You know, our Republican counterparts have just said that these cuts are based on their priorities and choices. And when asked whether he voted to cut diplomatic security by over $300 million on CNN, Representative Chaffetz responded, absolutely. Look, we have to make priorities and choices in this country. But these cuts have impact, serious impact. And I want you to know that my priorities, including funding these recommendations, which will save lives. You know, the uh, ARB, uh, Mr. Narsom, just to, just to be clear, you you provided information to the ARB, is that correct? That's correct, yes. And Mr. Hicks, is it true that you also provided information? The ARB interview. The ARB. Yes. You know, it was led by uh, Ambassador Pickering, Pickering and Admiral Mullen, uh, who, who happens to be the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. 
In its investigation, the review, the review board interviewed more than 100 people, reviewed thousands of pages of documents, and viewed hours of videotapes. The board made 29 recommendations to improve security systems and procedures to prevent future deadly attacks. And a key finding made by the board related to availability of funding is specifically for temporary facilities in high-risk, high-threat environments. And the board stated, the Department should develop minimum security standards for occupancy of temporary facilities in high-risk, high-threat environments and seek greater flexibility for the use of Bureau of Overseas Buildings Operations sources of funding so that they can be rapidly made available for security upgrades at such facilities. And it is important to note that the facility in Benghazi was designated as a temporary facility. Uh, Mr. Nordstrom, do you agree with the Board's review? That was actually one of the specific things that I talked with the, uh, the Board. Uh, my concern is there is no such thing when you look at the FAM or the uh, OSPB standards for a temporary facility. Uh, and so by its very nature, it's a So they developed the recommendation. After the fact. How about fact. you, Mr. Hicks? Do you agree with the recommendation? I'm not a, a security expert. I'm a diplomat. I'm an economic officer. Uh, but I support every improvement that can possibly made, be made to improve our security overseas, including increasing the training of our personnel. Thank you. I thank so the much. gentleman. I, I, would, I would also thank the gentleman from Missouri, but, but ask, were you here on October 10th when the person who had those requests for additional security said money was not a factor, Charlene Lamb? Do you remember her? I was, I can't remember if I was at this. Well, Mr. Nordstrom, you were on that panel. Do you remember what uh, she said? Uh, yes, she said that resources was not an issue. And I think I would also point to the ARB report, if I'm not mistaken, that they talked to our chief financial officer with DS, uh, who also said that resources were not an issue. So. Mr. Chairman, the ARB says resources were an issue. Well, well, I guess the, the question that I have about the ARB, and again, it's not what the ARB has, is what it doesn't have, and that it stops short of the very people that need to be asked those questions, and that's the Undersecretary of Management and above. Those are perfect questions that he needs and, to And I'm find. sure that if we implement some of the recommendations, it will help us prevent a future attack. And, and I appreciate that. And, and what I would say is that in the earlier hearing, uh, in October 10th, the one thing we did discover is, yes, this facility was not able to take the blows even of a small bomb that had gone off earlier. Mr. Nordstrom testified to the fact that this, uh, this consulate, temporary consulate, had been attacked twice and they had breached the wall. Uh, so there, there was an awful lot of recognition that it was an insufficient facility, and I think that's ARB, no ARB, that is something that is well in the committee's record. But I thank you for bringing it out. Thank you. We now go to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Micah. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, first of all, I have to again uh, tell the families that we will continue to pursue this, and uh, all the facts need to be known about what took place and hold people accountable. And then next to the witnesses, uh, thank you for uh, your service. Uh, thank you for your bravery in actually coming forward. Uh, uh, and again, some of the commendable acts of uh, the State Department employees you described. Um, as everybody may know, and we, I follow up really um, on uh, my colleague Mr. Clay's question about the, the report there, uh, Accountability Review Board report, and I've got this is the unclassified version. There's a classified version also. This is available online, and we have a responsibility under law <laughs> to review these situations and uh, to go to people who actually had firsthand knowledge. Now, uh, Mr. Thompson, you have a very important position. The title is Bureau of Counterterrorism and Leader, Foreign Emergency Support Team. U.S. Department of State, right? Correct. Okay. And uh, did, did you participate? Were you interviewed by the ARB? I was not. You, you were not interviewed. Okay. And uh, you, you were on the job during this period? 
I was at my desk that night till two o'clock in the morning. And you were not allowed uh, to convey information to the uh, board? On the 17th, I uh, conveyed my uh, request to be interviewed before the board. And so they, they did interview you after that? No. You have, have you ever been interviewed? I have not. You have not. So you're one of the primary players, but yet the board failed to interview. That's, would you say that's correct? Uh, that is a correct Mr. statement. Mr. Thompson? <laughs> Is he an important player? I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, Hicks, is Mr. Thompson an important player in this, Mr. Nordstrom? Uh, I, would, uh, I would say yes, uh, okay. certainly in the aftermath of the attack. Okay. Let me go to uh, uh, Charge, Charge uh, Hicks. Were you interviewed by the board? I was interviewed by the board. Were you able to convey all the information that you felt was necessary to, uh, regarding this uh, incident the, to the board? The interview took about two hours, and it uh, was, uh, in my mind, incomplete. Uh, a few days later, I had a separate meeting briefly with the executive secretary. So you did have a follow-up meeting, and you with, expressed that With the board's executive secretary to amplify on some issues that had been discussed at the meeting, at okay. the initial interview. And Mr. Nordstrom, um, did you participate? I did on, on two occasions. I also shared with them a uh, voluminous amount of... Could you share how that process of, worked that we heard from Mr. Hicks? Sure. Is this the same, similar... Uh, was it thorough? I, I felt it was thorough and professional. Um, as I said, uh, the report, and, and as I've held, the report is fairly thorough and comprehensive. Mm -hmm. My issue is that they stopped short of interviewing people that I personally know were involved in key decisions that led to how those events unfolded, well, it's, specifically it's, it's, how those buildings were yeah. staffed and constructed and in variance with existing standards. Those so are all fell, critical to the... They fell short. Well, in the uh, unclassified version, they said uh, security in Benghazi was not recognized and implemented as a shared responsibility by the bureaus, Washington, uh, bureaus in Washington charged with supporting the post, resulting in stovepipe decisions on policy and security. Now, the next part is interesting. That being said, Embassy Tripoli, Tripoli did not demonstrate strong and sustained advocacy with Washington for increased security for special mission Benghazi. Would you both agree I, with that? If I could speak to that, uh, I would uh, disagree that uh, it was um, a collaborative process. I'm not sure exactly the, the term they used. Uh, on a number of occasions, I testified in October as well, I raised issues, others raised issues, the ambassador raised issues, the DCM raised issues. Uh, to the point where reports and decisions on both the Tripoli compound and the Benghazi compound were decided in Washington, and those decisions were not either cleared with us or shared with us. So that doesn't seem as a, a collaborative uh, well, process. I want to have uh, time for Mr. Hicks to tell us about his. Uh, thank you, Mr. Norton. Yes, sir. I was. I monitored the discussions that Eric has testified about from uh, my Arabic language student status. Uh, when I arrived in Tripoli, I had the understanding that these decisions had been settled and that we were not to relitigate them in terms of the number of personnel at security personnel at post. Uh, I began a process to attempt to relitigate them in mid-August and we held an EAC meeting to discuss the matter, uh, and we were un unfortunately unable to return to that issue uh, before 9-11 occurred. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we now recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also want to thank the witnesses for their courageous service and your willingness to come before the committee here today. I also want to offer my condolences again to Ambassador Stevens and his family. Tyrone Woods and his family, Glenn Doherty of Massachusetts and his family, and Sean Smith. Uh, these were American heroes, and uh, they were our very best. I don't want that part to be overlooked. Uh, these individuals were regarded as our very best, including a Ambassador Stevens. Uh, without question, I think his, uh, his opinion and, and, and uh, the, the 
respect that his experience and, and uh, authority in, in matters, all matters in Lebanon, excuse me, uh, Libya, and uh, not only in, in Tripoli, but also in Benghazi was, was unquestioned, I think. And uh, it showed in the deference that others gave him to those decisions. I thought the ARB report uh, especially d did single out some areas where I, I thought they were, were uh, trying to identify where the, where the decisions w that were made uh, may have been deficient. And they, they do in identify at page 30, uh, they talk about uh, the, Depart the Bureau of Diplomatic Security and NEA, the Near Eastern Affairs. And at post, there appeared to be a very real confusion over who ultimately was responsible and empowered to make decisions based on policy and security considerations. Uh, it, they go on further to say the DS Bureau showed a lack of proactive senior leadership with respect to Benghazi, failing to ensure that the priority security needs of a high risk, high threat post were met. And at the same time, with attention in late 2011 shifting to a grow, growing crisis in Egypt and Syria, the NEA Bureau's front office showed a lack of ownership of Benghazi's security issues and, and a tendency to rely totally on diplomatic security for the latter. The Board also found that Embassy Tripoli leadership, saddled with their own staffing and security challenges, did not single out a special need for increased security for Benghazi. Now, what they point to uh, in the next couple of paragraphs is uh, they thought that the result, uh, excuse me, that the special mission Benghazi extension, that this was a, a temporary residential facility not officially notified to the host government, even though it was also a full-time office facility, resulted in the special mission compound being accepted from office facility standards and accountability under Secure Embassy Construction and Counterterrorism Act of 1999. Mr. Nordstrom, your, your point exactly and uh, the Overseas Security Policy Board, OSPB. So what they are saying is because there was an extension made that there was a, a lowering in, in expectation there that the resources for, for physical security and also the personnel assignments needed at, at that was, was not given an, an adequate priority and that it was left to diplomatic security in some cases to make those repairs. Is that something that you see as being a a, a weak point in this whole process that allowed Benghazi to be uh, ill-prepared for the attacks on September 11th? I do. As I said, I think that uh, what still remains on scene is who made that decision to go ahead and assume that this is going to be a temporary facility. At one point, in fact, I was told by, the undersec by colleagues in OBO and DS that uh, the recommendations that we wanted to make, the upgrades, both in Tripoli and Benghazi, would not be made. They forwarded us the, the way forward documents that we discussed in October. Um, and they said, uh, and I quote, it is my understanding that M, Undersecretary for Management, agreed to the current compounds being set up in occupied condition as is. The ARB in particular found it interesting at my reply, which was in February of 2013. I requested, is anything in writing? If so, I would like a copy for post so we have it handy for the ARB. That is eight months before the attack. Right. I got no confirmation as to who made those decisions, nor did I get a copy of that. Uh, and so the status was still in limbo at that point. I know there were some discussions with Mr. Lankford earlier, the gentleman from Oklahoma, that. Uh, my, my, my understanding was the facility, again, the, the, the types of facilities are whether or not you are sole occupancy of the building or are you a partial occupancy of, say, a commercial building or if you are in a building which is owned by the host nation. Well, clearly we were the sole occupant and that is the standards. It is very clear and it is based on our threat and those standards. We did not meet any of those standards with the exception of perhaps the height of the wall. Okay. And thank you. My time has expired. I thank you. Uh, just one thing. You, you used the term M for the uh, Undersecretary for Management. Who was that? Uh, at the time and throughout all of this was, um, was Patrick Kennedy, who okay. was up here in October as well. So that is who would have been the person who said no or this is good enough, presumably? I, presumably. I, again, I don't know what the decisions, uh, the factors were in his decision. I am sure he had reasons for those decisions. I am not going to criticize those. My only concern is that 
nobody has looked at those, whether it be the ARB or, or anybody else. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Turner. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Gentlemen, I want to thank you for being here today. Without your statements, there is a tremendous amount of information that we just wouldn't know. And certainly it is important that you are giving us this information, as we all have the deep condolences uh, for the families. As we look at the information that we have gotten today, we basically have two stand-down decisions that we have been able to, uh, to discuss. One, the foreign emergency support team that Mr. Thompson has told us about, and um, uh, Mr. Hicks, you told us of Colonel Gibson. Uh, Mr. Hicks, I am a member of the House Armed Services Committee, and I am very fascinated with the stand-down order to Colonel Gibson. As we pursue that, we want to know who gave Colonel Gibson the order and, and why. And so we want, I would like to review that stand-down order with you and, and what you experienced that night since you were with him as he was receiving that stand-down order. You told us that there was a C-130 Libyan transport that had been provided and that uh, you had indicated to Colonel Gibson that he should go um, to reinforce Benghazi and help the withdrawal personnel. Colonel Gibson was told to, to stand down, and that plane left without him landing about 7.30 in Benghazi without Colonel Gibson's team. So let's start first with a review of what is Colonel Gibson's team. What were those personnel, Colonel Gibson's team, what were they doing in Libya? They are the, the remaining members of the special security team, this group of special 16 or 14 special forces personnel assigned to protect Embassy Tripoli after the return and reestablishment of the embassy in September of 2011. And on the 1st of August, the Secretary of Defense signed an order changing their status from being a security team to a training team and transferring the authority, their authority from the Chief of Mission, the Ambassador, to General Ham. In, uh, in, on August 6th, two members of that team were in a carjacking incident as they were driving early in the morning outside the, outside the compound and they had to use their weapons in order to escape that armed attack on their vehicle. Uh, in light of that incident, General Ham decided to, with, to draw down the team from 14 personnel to 4 personnel. And Lieutenant Colonel Wood and nine others, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Wood testified before this committee last October, uh, left Tripoli in the middle of the month. So we, the Lieutenant Colonel Gibson and the other three members of that team are the remainder of that group. So their chain of command had been changed and they, and they had been reduced. But as you were just describing, these are highly trained individuals with specialized skills that would have been useful in the situation in Benghazi. Yes, absolutely, and particularly given the fact, again, that the, the personnel in Benghazi were extreme, were exhausted from a night of fighting against uh, very capable opponents. Now, do you know why they were told to stand down? Colonel Gibson, give you any information or uh, understanding of? I, I actually don't know why. Is there any reason to believe that the situation in Benghazi was over? I mean, there were a number of series of attacks that you have described to us. Any reason to believe that, um, that there was no longer any danger in Benghazi? Uh, no, there it was every reason to continue to believe that our personnel were in danger. Mr. Chase, Mr. Chase has given me a, um, an article that appeared in USA Today just this week. And just as, as early as last Monday, um, Major Robert Furman, a Pentagon spokesman, said that the military's account that was first issued weeks after the attack hasn't changed. There was never any kind of stand-down order to anybody. And that's a pretty broad statement, anybody. What's your reaction to the quote by Mr. Furman? I can only again repeat that Lieutenant Colonel Gibson said he was not to proceed to board the airplane. So your firsthand experience being on the site, standing next to Colonel Gibson, who was on his way on that C-130 uh, transport um, and being told not to go, contradicts what Mr. Furman is saying on behalf of the Pentagon? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Hicks, um, did the Embassy have a defense attache on staff whose role it was to interface with the Defense Department? And it, did you ask him at that evening, was the, were there any resources coming from the U.S. Uh, military? And um, you know, what was your, your reaction to his responses as the evening unfolded? Um, my reaction was that 
okay, we are on our own. We are going to have to try to pull this off with the resources that we have available. Were the Libyans uh, surprised? I don't know, but I think they were. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, before we go to Mr. Connolly, just because most people in the audience, including on the dais, don't understand Chief of Mission authority, would you, as Chief of Mission, run us through who was under your Chief of Mission authority and who wasn't? In other words, who did you have command and control of? And we are talking about military assets, because I think a lot of folks up here are hearing two chains of command, and it would be helpful for you to explain it as a career State Department person quickly. All, all civilian personnel in civilian USG personnel in Libya were under chief of mission authority, which was Chris which was Stevens, yours until he was. We knew that he was dead, and then that passed to me. The four members of the special forces team were under General Ham's authority. We had two other military special forces personnel in country, and I was at that time unclear as to whether they were under my authority okay. or not. So anyone you had under your authority, you gave orders to, they responded, they went down range if you asked them to. The others uh, were not allowed to. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Connolly, thank you very much. You will have your full time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for that clarification. By the way, uh, there have been some statements that Under Secretary Kennedy was not interviewed by the ARB, uh, by Ambassador Pickering and Admiral Mullen. That is a misstatement fact. He most certainly was. You can look it up. It is documented. He was interviewed and he provided evidence, and that evidence was evaluated. So it is simply not true that, uh, that the Under Secretary Kennedy was not part of that process. He most certainly was. And I would ask, Mr. Chairman, the, re the record so reflect. Uh uh, who, who said he wasn't? I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, there, hmm? I think we've heard it from the table. Um, okay. Mr. Uh, Mr. Thompson, he, uh, statements have been attributed to you that your bureau, the Counterterrorism Bureau, was actually deliberately kept out of post Benghazi uh, uh, developments, decision making, and so forth. Is that an, are those statements attributed to you accurate? It's true that my portion of this office is not was not participating. Your portion. To whom did you report? I report to Dan Benjamin at the time. And did Mr. Benjamin was he included in? He was overseas at the time. He was overseas, but was he kept informed and involved? I kept him informed in the early stages of. Was he kept informed and involved by the secretary's office? I have no idea. Would it surprise you to learn that he has stated emphatically that he most certainly was? Uh, it wouldn't be a surprise. I've read it. And would it surprise you that he contradicts your statements or statements attributed to you? And I read to you this charge that uh, we were kept out of the, the loop in the aftermath is simply untrue. Though I was out of the country on official travel uh, at the time of the attack, I was in frequent contact with the Department. At no time did I feel the Bureau was in any way being left out of deliberations that it should have been part of, unquote. I would disagree. He's, he's true factually. He is, um, his, his view of how much of okay. the key so, Bureau was. So for the uh, record, if I may, sir, if, if, he, if he thinks the, he was adequately informed and, and, con and uh, given counsel on that, then uh, that is his, his professional. Well, he is the head of the Bureau, and he is, in fact, your, or was your supervisor, and that is his testimony. So it contradicts you. I, I don't think it is his testimony, sir. Well, I am entering it into the record, so it is now in the te evidentiary record. And Were the gentleman we could, we could, No, not, not, I will, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I hold the time. Okay, uh, certainly. I, uh, we, Mr. C uh, Cummings, uh, perhaps you were here, perhaps not, has said among a lot of people that we want to bring before this committee, Mr. he is now an anticipated future right. witness, so he can give testimony. The, the chairman anticipated exactly the point I was going to make. So we, we can clear that up by having Mr. Benjamin here. Thank you. Mr. Hicks, I don't think anyone who could have listened to your account, uh, the minute-by-minute -minute account of what happened, could, could be anything but moved. Um, the trauma of what you and your colleagues must have gone through, especially being in Tripoli, not being able physically to sort of reach out and do something about Benghazi, I, I think all of us can relate to that. It's terrible. I was in Libya and Tripoli in May of last year before the tragedy, and I don't remember whether we had a chance to meet or not, but 
um, uh, David Dreyer led, uh, led our CODEL. We were not allowed to stay in Libya overnight. What struck me when I arrived in Tripoli was that uh, airport security was provided by a militia. And, you know, I've traveled a lot over my years in foreign policy, and, I, you know, what goes through the mind is what could go wrong with this? Um, it's a volatile, violent, unstable, or was, situation. Um, do you want to talk just a little bit about the domestic situation in Libya as we found it? Because I think sometimes that gets forgotten in the retelling that we are facing instability in Libya still in a post-Gaddafi revolutionary situation and likewise in Benghazi. Uh, could you just share with us some insights into what you found in terms of that inherent instability? Thank you, Mr. Connolly, and uh, thank you for being uh, my representative. Uh, first of all, I just want to say that I don't recall saying that anyone other than myself testified to the ARB or was, was a, a witness before the ARB. Um, so I, I wanted to say, be clear about that. Um, the second thing is the political and, and security climate in Libya at the time. It was, it was uh, highly unstable, although after the elections, uh, we thought that the political trajectory, the elections in July, we thought the political trajectory was, was heading in the right direction. Uh, President Magariev had been selected. They were trying uh, to uh, appoint a new prime minister and move towards a, a democratic government. The security scene, however, was very unstable uh, and has been, I think, well documented. You had assassinations and car bombings in Benghazi, uh, but uh, the assessment was that this was Libyan on Libyan and not necessarily threat, uh, directed at foreigners, uh, at the same time that we are in the process of building towards making our post in Benghazi a permanent post, uh, the British are contemplating returning there to Benghazi. They left after their ambassador uh, survived an assassination attempt in June. In Tripoli, we also have instability. We have car bombings, carjackings. Um, we have Islamic uh, extremist militias that begin to attack Sufi, shrine, Sufi shrines and a government that is struggling to uh, maintain security and improve security in the, in the country. Thank you. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, if I could just say to my constituent, uh, we're, we're proud of you. Um, and uh, I would uh, add my voice uh, to that of Mr. Cummings. I'm a member of not only this committee, but the House Foreign Affairs Committee. And you have my personal pledge that were there ever to be any hint at retaliation or retribution for your willingness to uh, come forth and tell your version of what happened, um, this member of Congress will intervene on your behalf forcefully. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Well, Duncan. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And first of all, thank you for calling this hearing. There is obviously great interest in and concern about uh, what happened uh, uh, in this uh, tragic incident. Uh, Mr. Nordstrom, we have already heard uh, Mr. Thompson say that he uh, was never interviewed, even though he requested to be interviewed. Did I understand you correctly to say a few minutes ago that you know of other witnesses that had firsthand knowledge who were not interviewed by the board? Uh, no, I don't believe I. Oh, I'm, that. I guess I misunderstood about that. But I will tell you, though, I, uh, um, I was a criminal court judge for seven and a half years trying felony criminal cases, and uh, I can tell you that it's surprising that uh, anybody with firsthand knowledge wouldn't be interviewed uh, about this unless uh, somebody did not want to um, have a complete report. Mr. Thompson, why were you, why were, what were you told was the reason you were not interviewed? I was not given a reason, sir. You were not given a reason. Mr. Uh, Hicks, do you feel that uh, the report lets any individual or bureaucracy off the hook? Uh, yes, sir. I think that uh, in our system of government, the uh, decision-making authority is at the level of presidentially appointed Senate confirmed individuals. That is at the level of assistant secretary or higher. Now, the reporting coming out of Embassy Tripoli on conditions there, particularly the, the fact that we had to provide a daily report of who was in country to Undersecretary Kennedy and the 
fact that he made the decision as to who came to Tripoli and Benghazi or who didn't, that budgets were, came to his table and that security threat environment reports also came to his table would suggest that there is some responsibility there. Uh, Mr. Thompson, let me ask you this. Uh, uh, I find, another thing I find surprising is, is that um, do the um, security people not consider the date of 9-11 to be, I, we've already uh, heard, heard somebody say that uh, this um, mission was considered to be a high threat or a high risk uh, mission. Do they not realize that 9-11 is a high security type date and they should be prepared for terrorist activities on that date in particular? Uh, certainly. Um, when I hear security, I think, I think of uh, Greg Nordstrom, so I won't go down the security trail too far here, but certainly on the anniversary of 9-11, uh, since 9-11-2001, we have all uh, had our antenna up, so to speak, and, and been uh, uh, forward-leaning, if, if not uh, physically, mentally, on that particular day, yes. The report basically puts primary blame for the, uh, this situation on the Bureau of Diplomatic Security. I would like to ask if any of you have a comment uh, about that. Do you think that is fair? If, if I could, uh, yes, Mr. Norton. maybe this might also uh, address uh, Congressman Connolly's uh, question. Well, my, my concern with the report um, is not that, that Under Secretary Kennedy was or was not interviewed. I, I don't know who was interviewed. Again, that is part of the confidentiality of it. But there has been a lot of discussion of, of how many people were supposed to be there or not supposed to be there. Those things are not driven by regulations and law. That is a subjective uh, opinion. Obviously, I made that was quite a bit of, of my testimony in October. I, I go back to who authorized embassy employees, U.S. government employees, to go into facilities that did not meet legal requirements. I don't know who made that decision. And the reason why is because, as Ambassador Pickering said, he has decided to fix responsibility on the assistant secretary level and below. How I see that is, that is fine. It is an accountability of mid-level officer review board. And the message to my colleagues is that if you are above a certain level, no matter what your decision is, no one is going to question it. And that is my con uh, concern with the ARB. Mr. Hicks, do you, uh, uh, f did you find other short shortcomings in the report? Well, I, I found find shortcomings in the process. In the process. Although I was interviewed for two hours, I was never allowed to review the recording of my testimony to the board. I was never given an opportunity to read the unclassified report before it was published to see if my testimony had been incorporated or properly, at all or properly. And I have never been given an opportunity to read the classified report. All right. Thank you very much. I thank you. Uh, I must admit, one of the rules of this committee is that interviews and depositions the witness actually gets a copy of and is allowed uh, to make corrections uh, in most cases to make sure that they didn't misstate something. So that, that is a little surprising to me. The gentlelady from California, Ms. Spear. Mr. Chairman, um, you know, it's, it's ironic that you said that, Mr. Chairman, since Mr. Thompson would not even engage with the Democratic side of the aisle in terms of um, answering any series of questions. But let me um, first of all say to the family members, we lost extraordinary servants to this country. You lost loved ones. And there is nothing that we can say that will ever heal your huge loss. But know that we will do everything in our power to make sure that other families do not go through what you are going through. To you, um, Mr. Hicks, thank you for your extraordinary service. You know, as you were retelling the events, and they were harrowing, um, it reminded me of an experience that I had 
similar uh, in a foreign country, ambushed, and a sense that uh, we were woefully underprotected. And I think as part of what we are going to glean from this today is that we have got to do a much better job of providing protection in high-risk, high-threat embassies and council offices around the world. It was inadequate, and I am troubled by the fact that, that General Ham withdrew additional support because they had been engaged in a carjacking. If anything, that would heighten our concern and we would create more support. Let me, um, though, ask you a question. You said earlier today that the lawyers at State told you not to talk to Mr. Chaffetz when he came. That is what I wrote down. And, and would you just verify that that is what you said? We were not to be personally interviewed by Congressman Chaffetz. <clears throat> now, in your interview with the committee, you were asked the question, <clears throat> excuse me, did you receive any direction about information that Congressman Chaffetz shouldn't be given from Washington? And your answer was, no, I did not. Is that still your testimony today? I don't recall that phrase. And well, I've been, I, I thought that I said, and I'd have to review again, that I did receive instructions exactly as I said them, uh, but I did not know who gave them to me because I did not have, at that time, have access to my email from uh, my time as DCM in Tripoli. If the gentlelady could just tell us what page of the transcript that is on. Uh, maybe the staff can get it for me. I am reading from a separate uh, oh, thank you. document. You did say that you were told to make sure other State Department officials were present for meetings with Representative Chaffetz. As you stated, they told me not to be isolated with Congressman Chaffetz. Is that correct? Yes, that is what I mean by not to have a personal interview with, with Congressman Chaffetz. Okay, so it was more about not being in a situation where you did not have other people um, with you. Is that correct? As would, opposed to not being interviewed. That's, and again, that is what I said, not to, have a per, not to be personal, personally interviewed by Congressman Chaffetz. It said, well, you said they told me not to be isolated with Congressman Chaffetz. I, uh, that's the that's the meaning of isolated, not to be personally interviewed. There was a, a classified briefing for Mr. Chaffetz that no other State Department official was able to attend, and you testified earlier. So, as a result, no other State Department officials can confirm what was said if there was a mischaracter mischaracterization after the fact. So when Representative Chaffetz returned to Washington and attended this committee's hearing in October, there was a great deal of controversy about his description of that classified briefing. Did you by chance watch the hearing? Uh, actually, I didn't, but I don't think I said that no State Department official was allowed in, the, in that well, the I, annex briefing. Uh, in fact, uh, I was in that briefing, David McFarland was in that briefing, and the RSO John Martinick was in, in The attorney was not. The attorney was excluded by the annex chief for clearance purposes. Okay, when you received a call from Cheryl Mills, actually, let me ask you a, a different question. Um, the gentlelady's time has expired, but go ahead and ask your last question oh, quickly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think you deserve to have a post in a location um, that you desire. So I would like to ask you, um, where would you like to be posted? The Court of King James is out of the question. <laughs> uh, the country I would most like to go to, is that the question yes. that you are NB assigned to? You know, I'd really want to talk to the, my uh, decision maker, chief decision maker in my family, who's sitting right 
over here, my wife, because I think her opinion is more important than mine on that point. And so to, just to, to conclude, Mr. Chairman, um, I believe He really is a diplomat, <laughs> Ms. Pierce. Well, most of you should be diplomats on issues like that. Uh, Ms. Dibble had said to you that she would help you get a good onward assignment. And um, I think this committee will help you get a good onward assignment. So we await your, um, the responsible person for that decision informing us. I, I thank the gentlelady, and I'm actually shocked that Mr. Connolly didn't make that uh, a promise to a constituent who could vote. <laughs> and, we, and with that, we go to the representative from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry. Uh, not to bring the subject matter of this hearing back to the subject matter of this hearing, but uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Hicks, uh, the Senate is in charge of, uh, of those types of movements of our ambassadors in the confirmation process. I, but I hear uh, uh, the, it, you know, there's a wide variety of islands just to the south of uh, Florida that are lovely. <clears throat> But the subject matter of today's hearing is to get at the root cause and the root facts of an awful tragedy that occurred, the mismanagement, then the political cover-up that resulted from that mismanagement, and a rush to judgment by some very ambitious political operatives within Washington. At least that is near as what I can tell, having gotten into the facts as we have today and knowing what we know today. So I want to thank all three of you gentlemen for your service to the American people and to our government. And uh, I want to uh, say to you that uh, the tough treatment you have gotten as a result, uh, not only on that day in September, but since then is uh, a horrible tragedy. I want to go back to Mr. Gowdy's line of questions here. Mr. Hicks, was there a protocol within the consulate in the event of a protest? Yes, there was. Uh, was there any evidence in when you were there in Libya on that day that this was uh, a protest? No, there was none. And uh, I am confident that Ambassador Stevens would have reported a protest immediately if one appeared on his door. The protocol, of course, was for us to evacuate immediately the, from the consulate and move to the annex. Okay. Was, uh, was there anything in connection to a YouTube video? Um, was there any awareness uh, that it was the, uh, the events occurred because of a YouTube video? The, the YouTube video was a non-event in Libya. Okay. And did you know about that? within a couple days or the day of? Yes. Okay. Um, and so did you report to anyone in Washington within the first couple of days that there was anything in connection, a protest in connection to a YouTube video? No. The only report that our mission made through every channel was that there had been a, an attack on a consulate. Not a protest. No protest. You can leave your microphone off. I'm going to come back to you a few times. Okay. Uh, Mr. Gowdy mentioned this earlier, but on September 16th, Ambassador Susan Rice went on the Sunday shows, recited a whole group of talking points. Were you a part of uh, uh, those talking points? No, I had no role in their preparation. Okay. So one month later, we had an Under Secretary Kennedy. Uh, let's play his statement. Always made clear from the very beginning that we are giving out the best information we have at the time we are giving it out. That information has evolved over time. For example, if any administration official, including any career official, had been on television on Sunday, September 16th, they would have said the same thing that Ambassador Rice was said. She had information at that point from the intelligence community, and that is the same information I had, and this, I would have made exactly the same points. Clearly, we know more today, but we knew what we knew when we knew it. By September 16th, did you know what you know what you know, which is apparently what Susan Rice said? L let, me, let me rephrase that, actually. Let me actually make that a question, if you will. Ambassador Rice uh, recited a, a set of facts 
A month later, they defend it, they, the State Department defends that. You are a career State Department official. Would you have said the things that Ambassador Rice said? Not after hearing what President Magariev said, especially considering the fact that he had gone to, Libya, to Benghazi himself at great personal and uh, political risk. And for him to sh appear on world television and say this was a planned attack is by, uh, by terrorists is phenomenal. My, I was jumping up and down when he said that. It was a gift for us from a policy perspective, from my perspective, sitting in Tripoli. And did that occur before September 16th? He said that on the talk, same talk shows with, with uh, Ambassador Rice. And, and did you report that? Uh, was there knowledge that he was going to say that? No, there was not. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I know we have a lot more questions about this, including what that did in country, Ambassador Rice's rhetoric, what that did and the impact it had in country for the work that you were doing and the delay that, that resulted because of that of the FBI investigation on the ground. If you could speak to that, and Mr. Chairman, if, if you'll indulge me, uh, and let him answer, please. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Chairman. Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, again, it took 17, 18 days for us to, from the, that interview to get the FBI to Benghazi. And we dealt with people at a low level, and we got them to Benghazi by stringing together a series of basically low level commitments to help us get them to Benghazi. Thank you. The gentleman from Wisconsin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, to, to the families, again, of those who uh, lost their lives in Benghazi, uh, you have uh, our condolences. And uh, I think the best tribute we can give uh, to those who have lost their lives is to make sure that we make sure this doesn't happen again. And I think that is really the goal of the committee. Um, gentlemen, thank you for being here today. Uh, Mr. Hicks, especially thank you for your extensive um, conversation about what happened during the confusion of those first hours, uh, whether the ambassador was at the hospital or the annex and all that happened. I, I can tell you um, about 16 years ago I was backpacking through the Darien Gap in Columbia and woke up to machine gun fire and hand grenades. And uh, at the time we didn't know what happened. We had paramilitaries on the river, we had guerrillas behind us, and we were caught in between. So I can fully understand the full confusion that happened. Uh, at that time in your recanting of that, and I think we saw that in the report. Um, what I can tell you, though, Mr. Chairman, is you know, I don't think there is a smoking gun today. I don't even think there is a lukewarm slingshot. Uh, what we have is uh, some strong uh, opinions from people who all, uh, at least I know Mr. Nordstrom and Mr. Hicks, both participated in the, the study. Uh, and Mr. Thompson, while he didn't, uh, no one stopped him. Uh, no one said he shouldn't go in the study. But we have had a chance to take a look at this. And I think what is really imperative is that we make sure that these recommendations are done, uh, that something uh, concrete comes out of this so that no one else uh, is in this situation. And I think one of the real things that we can do as a committee, as individuals on this committee, uh, is to make sure that uh, we provide adequate funding for security and training uh, to all of our embassies. And I think, you know, that I look at, I'm one of the new folks around here. So uh, when I look at some of the past budgets where we've been asked for literally hundreds of millions of dollars that haven't been approved in a post 9-11 world, uh, I look at that as rather risky. And both uh, Mr. Nordstrom and Mr. Hicks, you both have extensive experience around uh, the world and various places you've been. So looking at this proactively, I think this is probably the ninth or so hearing that the House has had on this issue. So maybe it is time we start looking at how we make sure we protect our embassies the very best way we can, rather than kind of going through and rehashing some of the same old stories. My, my question specifically for both Mr. Hicks and Mr. Nordstrom are, um, when it comes to extra training or extra security, uh, do you feel that we need uh, more in some of the embassies across uh, the, the world? so that make sure that those who are working in there indeed have the very best protections because we have that responsibility to them uh, as they ser serve the country? Uh, Mr. Hicks. Thank you. I think there are two things, and I appreciate the, appreciate the question. Uh, we, need, we in the State Department need more training for our people who are going to these critical threat posts, not only for our diplomatic security agents, but also for our everyday diplomats. We need to be able I, in my opening statement, I talked about my experience in Bahrain of de developing contacts who helped us get through some very difficult times in 2002 when our embassy was attacked twice 
and we were experiencing very severe anti-American demonstrations. We have to be able to engage. Our diplomats have to be out on the street. One of the reasons why we were perhaps caught off guard in Benghazi is because for security purposes, because we had so few personnel there, the consulate was basically on lockdown. And so it was very difficult for our principal officer to get out and mingle with the people and learn what was going on. This was magnified when I talked with a correspondent after the event who had been in Benghazi um, after 9-11. And the correspondent told me that the people of Benghazi were terrified by these Islamic extremist militias. We didn't have that sense prior to 9-11. And the only way we could have that sense is if we're out on the street. I think um, Under Secretary of State for, for Public Diplomacy, uh, Sonnenschein said it beautifully at the tribute in, in for uh, Anne Smedinghoff last week when she quoted uh, correspondent Edward R. Murrow about going the last three feet. That's what we as diplomats do. So if we're going to be going outside the embassies to meet with people and learn what's going on, we have to have the training to be able to respond rapidly and effectively to a desperate situation. So that's one thing. The other thing I, I, I believe that we need to do, and I, and I put this forth as part of my platform for in running for office in my speech to the Foreign Service, we need to develop a robust uh, paradigm for analyzing and, and mitigating risk, and one that is comprehensible to every member of the Emergency Action Committee. At the, and this would be a powerful tool for our regional security officers to be able to develop the kinds of programs and the kinds of activities that we need to mitigate risks that they identify through the use of this paradigm. Thank you. We now go to the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this uh, hearing. And uh, I, too, uh, agree with both sides of the aisle. This ought to continue with other hearings. And uh, uh, it was shocking to just hear a statement about this is rehashing same old stories. Uh, these aren't old stories. These aren't same old stories. This is a situation that is atrocious in that it happened. And it's about time we heard the stories for the first time that we're hearing today, and I thank the, the witnesses for being here to do that for us. And I appreciate your valor, and I appreciate the families and their sacrifice. Um, uh, Mr. Thompson, on several, several occasions already, it's been insinuated that not only did you uh, not ask to be interviewed by ARB, but that you refused. You've indicated on a couple occasions, no, you asked to be involved. Uh, l let me give you further opportunity. Um, and ask you why were you concerned about the ARB, IARB's failure to interview you, and did you raise any concerns with the Department about the uh, Review Board's unwillingness to interview you? The reason I was concerned about it was that it was a terrorist event, and we did not respond to a terrorist event with the team, or we weren't considered to, and there wasn't a uh, normal process by which that goes through. That process that I've already uh, uh, stated is not one that is bureaucratic. It's one that can go from a cold start to um, wheels up, so to speak, within hours. Um, On the ground experience, understanding uh, of what you were yes, asked to do. Yes, uh, with respect to places like uh, Nairobi, Kenya, uh, on August 7, 1998, in which we had uh, 12 murdered Americans, uh, 240 murdered Kenyans, and thousands injured. Um, a very un, uh, a very ambiguous situation, and a situation in which we responded to uh, and and uh, collaborated with our DoD and our FBI colleagues. Even OFTA was there because we had to get uh, Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance. We even had to get them in there to help with the medical resupply because the uh, hospitals were overrun by this event. Uh, we had to set up a new embassy. Uh, because the, the, we had one that was destroyed. Uh, we had to set up all the communications for the ambassador, so it was uh, a fairly comprehensive response. Such was not the case in Tripoli with Mr. Hicks. 
However, uh, we did have a, a need to get uh, people pushed forward early. Uh, and uh, even if they did not end up in Tripoli, they would be closer. Again, talk, going back to the tyranny of distance, whether we would have landed in Frankfurt or Siganella or Crete or someone in the, somewhere in the area, uh, those are the things I would have brought out to uh, the board had I been interviewed. Any of those findings included in the ARB report? Uh, not to my knowledge, but I also have not seen a classified version. They may be in there. Mr. Hicks, in a little deference to my colleague from Ohio, I'd say on top of all of your distinguished uh, records of achievement and accolades, your two earned degrees from University of Michigan are your best. And I appreciate that. Let me, let me ask you this. Uh, do you know if anyone interviewed by the ARB was provided an opportunity to read the full classified report? I've talked to several witnesses who uh, were interviewed by the ARB, and none of them have been allowed to read the classified report. As far as you know, none that were interviewed have read the the classified report? So far as I know. So you mentioned that there was a 2 a.m. phone call with the Secretary of State. During that, that short phone call conversation that you rehearsed for us, was there any mention of a demonstration during that conversation? No. It would be interesting to know if that was included in the report, uh, but you've not read it. Uh, in fact, it wasn't. Um, do you think the ARB report lets any individual or bureaucracy off the hook? Uh, again, uh, as I mentioned er earlier, given the decision making that Under Secretary Pat Kennedy was making with respect to Embassy Tripoli and Consulate Benghazi operations, uh, he has to bear some responsibility. What, in your view, were the shortcomings of the ARB process besides not? interviewing some people and allowing the classified report to be read? Uh, well, again, there was no stenographer in the room when we were interviewed. No stenographer? No, sir. And so we're talking about editorial commentary potential as opposed to clear truth accuracy? That's correct. They, there were note takers. Um, I had counsel in the room with me taking notes uh, but uh, other witnesses did not have counsel or may not have had counsel. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, Mr. Thank Chairman, you. I don't have that benefit on the campaign trail to not have accurate reporting. Thank you. Well, it's, uh, Congress created the ARB in 1986, uh, so we have the ability to professionalize it by congressional action. Perhaps that will be something we will recommend. We now go to the gentlelady from Illinois, uh, Ms. Duckworth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thank you for your bravery in being here today and, and for your service to our nation. Um, I, I really believe that the best way to honor the sacrifice of Ambassador Stevens and the three other Americans who gave their lives in the line of duty in a final act of devotion to this nation, um, the best thing that we can do is to put aside politics and take a hard look at the facts of what went wrong and what we need to do as we move forward to make sure this never, ever happens again. And I share the frustration that many of my colleagues have expressed about the fact that we did not have the opportunity to properly prepare for your testimony today um, or to participate in a bipartisan investigation. Um, you know, I want to take a look particularly at um, what we can do to strengthen our missions, particularly in parts of the world where we cannot rely on host governments to provide adequate security, what we need to do to strengthen our ability to protect our, our posts. Um, as you have mentioned already, this includes better security measures and more U.S. security personnel. Um, Mr. Hicks, you had said that um, uh, regarding the ARB's recommendations that you thought it was incomplete, that the recommendations were unbalanced in favor of, I think you said, building higher walls, pouring more concrete, and that it was insufficiently strong in recommending that the State Department personnel needed to have more and better training, which is what you started to um, respond to my colleague from Wisconsin, Mr. Procan. Could, could you elaborate further on what you believe needs to be done with um, improvements in training? Again, the, the the point I made is that those of us who are, whose job is to engage 
the local population, to represent America mm -hmm. to uh, local populations, we have to be able to go outside. We have to be able to meet them in their own places, especially in a part of the world where hospitality is a major part of the culture and where also the demonstration of personal courage is an important part of the culture. Mm -hmm. So that means that we have to, as individuals, those of us who go outside, have to be able to be cognizant of the situations that we're going into. We have to be situationally aware, I think, is, is, as Eric would say, in order to recognize in advance that we may be getting into a difficult situation and we need to be able to respond appropriately. Mm -hmm. And if we are put in a situation of extremis, then we have to also have the ability to uh, be able to protect ourselves mm -hmm. in that situation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Nordstrom, um, I, wanted, I know that you didn't have, not have a chance to answer, um, elaborate on um, my colleague's question. Um, how do you, what is your opinion? Because I really want to make sure that we get the lessons learned from this. Um, you know, is there a, a balance that could be struck between focusing on improvements to physical security and also focusing on improvements to training, as Mr. Hicks suggested, or maybe dynamic communications? Do you have any specific recommendations? Uh, is, is a perfect one. Uh, you know, my, my concern is that in the, in the wake of an attack, we are going to go through the same cycle that we have gone through right. all the time. More money is not always the solution. More is not always the solution. Mm -hmm. Better is the solution. Yep. Um, uh, during the process, I, I had somebody ask me uh, as part of the, the ARB whether or not why had I not requested machine guns, 50 caliber machine guns for the consulate in Benghazi. I was awestruck. I said, if we are to the point where we have to have machine gun nests at a diplomatic institution, isn't there a larger question, what are we doing? Why, are we have, why do we have staff there? Um, I, you know, one of the recommendations that, that, that I looked at is, uh, again, it, it's, it's decision making processes. That doesn't cost money. One of the things that we saw, again, is what is the role of DS? Is DS, diplomatic security, elevated high enough within the Department of State's uh, organizational structure whereby recommendations that are within that organization are heard by the Secretary of State? I mean, I think she has a very re reasonable assertion that some of these issues weren't brought to her attention. Well, how do we fix that so that they are brought to the attention of the Secretary of State? It is not lost on me that as the unheeded messenger this time around, I look at where those messages seem to stop, the Undersecretary for Management. I look back and I see the last time we had a, a major attack was East Africa. Uh, Mr. Thompson's talked about it. Who was in that same position when the unheeded messengers of the Ambassador in Nairobi and the RSO in Nairobi were, were raising those concerns? It just so happens it is the same person. The, assistant sec uh, the Under Secretary for Management was in that same role before. So if anybody should understand this, I would hope that he would. So that is why I am going to the, the point of there is something apparently wrong with the process of how those security recommendations are raised to the Secretary. I agree. I, I think that you have given us a, uh, a great way forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I thank the gentlelady. We now go to the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Amash. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for the witnesses for testifying today. Thank you for your service. Uh, Mr. Hicks from a Michigan alum, Go Blue. Uh, Mr. Hicks, you testified that you haven't read the final classified ARB report. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, if, if you haven't been allowed to read the report, how do you know whether your testimony was used appropriately? I, I have no idea. Uh, have the the Department of employees who are singled out for disciplinary, disciplinary action, uh, were they allowed to read the final uh, classified ARB report to find out uh, what, to examine the evidence that was used against them? Two of those individuals have told me that they were not allowed to read the classified report. Do you believe that the ARB report does enough to ensure that a similar tragedy doesn't take place in the future? 
Again, I, I haven't read the complete report, so I can't make a judgment at this point in time. Did you, did you have an opportunity to provide input uh, with respect to the report? Yes, I had a two-hour conversation, conversation with the board. All right. I am going to uh, yield some time to the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chaffetz. Uh, thank you. Mr. Hicks, um, do we typically need permission of a host nation government to fly military aircraft over their territory? Yes, we do. And to your knowledge, did we ever ask the Libyans for permission to fly over their country? Frequently. But did we the night of the attack? The night of the attack? Night of the, once this incident started, did we seek permission from the Libyan government to, fly, to do a flyover? I think in the record there is uh, a UAV was flying over Libya that night, and it had, there, it had permission to be there. Did we ever ask for permission to fly anything other than an unarmed drone over Libya during the attack? No. Would you have known that? Yes. Based on your extensive experience as a diplomat in dealing with the Libyan government, do you believe the Libyans would have granted overflight rights if we had requested it? I believe they would have. Mr. Nordstrom, do you believe that would also be true? I, I think certainly in this situation they were fairly, uh, yeah. Mr. Chairman, I think one of the unanswered questions here is if it is a possibility, if, it's, has an, if there's any chance that we could get military uh, uh, overflight, if we could get a military flight there, then we would ask permission in advance. My concern is there was never an intention, there was never an attempt to actually get these military aircraft over there. I think one of the hard questions we have to ask is not only about the tankers, but what was the NATO response? We flew for months over Libya, months we conducted an air campaign. And we have assets. We have NATO partners. We worked, for instance, with the Italians. It is stunning that our government, the power of the United States of America, couldn't get a tanker in the air. Mr. Hicks, when did you think that this was actually over? It was done. We were safe. Not until our personnel landed in Tripoli. On the C-130. And then, even then, we were, Ansar al-Sharia had posted that, that we were potentially, I mean, there's a reason why you had to leave the facility in, in Tripoli. That's correct. When did you actually return to the embassy in Tripoli? We returned, I believe, on the 14th. When did the FAST team arrive to help secure the embassy? They arrived on the night of September 12th at about 8. And there so. still, there still was a potential fight. And the government never asked for permission. This is one of the deep concerns. In the, the, last, minute, the last minute here, I, I, I want to ask uh, Mr. Thompson here. I want to read to you another excerpt of an email sent by you to Timothy Walsh and James Webster on Wednesday, September 12th. This is at 11.10 in the morning. Quote, spoke to DB. Who is DB? Daniel Benjamin. Daniel Benjamin on the phone this morning, he understands my fest points, concurs, but expressed his pessimism regarding our deployment and by extension does not intend to lobby for our inclusion, end quote. To remind everybody here, didn't B Daniel Benjamin recently state that any claim that key elements of the Counterterrorism Bureau, such as fest, were cut out of the response planning was simply, quote, untrue? Is that, what, is that your understanding? Correct. How do you react to that? He goes out and publicly says that's not true, but based on the email, sounds like you had a discussion with him. What happened in that discussion? He was on the phone from Germany. Uh, another member of our front office had been talking to him. She uh, asked if he wanted to talk to me. I gave him a quick rundown of what uh, had happened the night before. I'd kept him in, informed uh, via BlackBerry on an unclass level about the concerns and, and obviously the, the, uh, uh, when, we, when we finally uh, uh, understood how many people had been murdered that night. Um, he was shocked and appalled, uh, wanted to know anything he could do, and I, uh, uh, I told him about the, uh, the dismissal and, and how it was dismissed in terms of, of getting our people out. Uh, get, getting our people out of town. And I would just add that it's more than process and it's more than um, 
some of the other things that have been stated. Um, my biography is in the record. Um, we lived by a code. That code says you go after people when they are in peril, when they are in the service of their country. Uh, we did not have the benefit of hindsight uh, in the early hours. And uh, those people who are in peril in the future need to know that we will go get them and we will, we will do everything we can to get them out of harm's way. That night uh, unfolded in ways that no one could have predicted when it first started. And uh, it is my strong belief then as it is now that we needed to uh, demonstrate that resolve even if we still had the same outcome. Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank thank the gentleman. Uh, for the purpose of the gentleman's seat. I just President. wanted to uh, reiterate, Mr. Chairman, uh, your point to me that uh, rather than speculate what Mr. Benjamin and Mr. Kennedy and others uh, may think or, or may have said, we will have the opportunity. Well, the we look, well, the we look forward Neal. to it. Uh, will, will the actually, Neal? all time has expired. Would we now go to the gentlelady from Illinois who has been patiently waiting, Ms. Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, too, would like to thank you for your service and thank you for your patience and endurance sitting here almost three hours and my condolences uh, to the family. Mr. Hicks, I would like to ask you about your testimony involving the flight from Tripoli to Benghazi. First, in your interview with the committee, you explained that the first plane from Tripoli to Benghazi left on the night of the attack around 1.15 a.m. Is that correct? No, it, it, it arrived in Benghazi about 1.15. It arrived, okay. The ARB report um, says that the first plane had a seven-person security team, which included two military personnel. Is that correct? Yes, it did. Now, you also told the committee that a second flight left Tripoli the next morning, September 12th, between 6 and 6.30 a.m. Is that correct? I think the flight actually left a little later, but again, the timelines are still not have merged to a great extent, okay. given time. Okay. You said that four military personnel were told not to board that plane and that this call came from Special Operations Command Africa. Is that right? That is what I understand. Okay. During the interview, you were asked if you knew what was the rationale that you were given that they couldn't go ultimately. And you explained, I guess, they just didn't have the right authority from the right level. Is that correct? I think that is correct. Okay. Uh, so you basically don't know why they were told not to get on the plane. I have right? no idea why they were told not to get, not why they were not allowed to go to the plane, go get on that airplane. Thank you. Just this morning, the Department of Defense uh, released a press release, if I can read it. The team leader called Special Operations Command Africa to update them that the movement of U.S. personnel to the Tripoli Annex was complete. He then reported his intention to move his team to Benghazi aboard the Libyan C-130. As the mission in Benghazi at that point had shifted to evacuation, the Special Operations Command Africa Operations Center directed him to continue providing support to the embassy in Tripoli. We continue to believe that there was nothing this group could have done had they arrived in Benghazi, and they performed superbly in Tripoli. In fact, when the first aircraft arrived back in Tripoli, these four played a key role in receiving, treating, and moving the wounded. I would like to yield the rest of my time to Mr. Conley. I thank my colleague. Um, Does the gentlelady want that in the record? Yes, please. Uh, without out objection, it will be placed in the record. Uh, Mr. Hicks. You quoted, uh, you, you said rather emphatically that the, the video had no material impact in Libya. That is correct. And you, quote, you, you talked several times about conversations, phone conversations with the Prime Minister who referred to it as a terrorist act, not as a protest. Is that correct? That is the President. Oh, the President. But we don't want to leave a misimpression here. I mean, the Libyan government is somewhat incohate at this time. I mean, it is hardly correct. a unified government. That is correct. And, for example, you were busy on the day, but on September 12th, the New York Times published a, a story quoting Libya's Deputy Interior Minister, uh, Wanis al-Sharif, who, uh, who said that uh, his initial instinct was to avoid a flaming the situation by risking a confrontation with people angry about the video in Libya. He, he said he also criticized the Americans at the mission for failing to heed what he said was the Libyan government's advice to pull its personnel or beef up its security, especially in light of recent violence in the city and the likelihood that the video would provoke protests. That same article interviewed 
people engaged in the assault in Benghazi who cited, according to the New York Times, the 14-minute video, that this was due to their anger. Now, my only point is, the Libyan government didn't speak with just one voice. There were disparate voices. Some, in fact, did see the video, apparently, at the time, as an influence. And it's a little, I don't want to mislead the public that there was one unified perspective and that was, that narrative is entirely false and was at the time. Would you care to comment? Sure. Our assessment in the embassy was that, sorry, the, the uh, video was not an instigator of anything that was going on in, in Libya. Now, I understand that these people were quoted. Uh, in fact, on September 20th, Prime Minister al Kib raised the video in, a, uh, in front of the press uh, when Deputy Secretary Burns was there. But we saw no demonstrations related to the video anywhere in Libya. The only event that transpired was the attack on our consulate on the night of September 11th. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I thank my colleague. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if there is no objection, I would like to enter into the record the full uh, New York Times article dated September 12th, Libya attack brings challenge for U.S. I certainly think under the circumstances it would be appropriate to put in the record something that says that uh, we were stupid to still have an a consulate in Benghazi, that, that it was an unreasonable risk and it should have been closed down in light of the danger. And, in fact, they may have been a video reaction. I think that is a good balance. I, I thank the Chairman for, uh, for that the unanimous consent comment. With that, we go to the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Gosar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, to the families, thank you for the heroism that uh, your, your sons uh, exhibited, I would tell you that. To the three of you um, at the stand, uh, thank you for your bravery, uh, particularly in light of how we treated whistleblowers um, today and in the past. Uh, Mr. Hicks, um, did you ever question officials in Washington about sec what Secretary Rice said on Sunday, the Sunday talk shows? Yes. Uh, again, when Assistant Secretary Jones called me after the, the, the talk show event, I asked her why she had said there was a demonstration when we had reported a, that there was a, an attack. Was she the only one that you talked about? Talked yes. To? Okay. And, and her reaction was? Her reaction, again, was, I don't know. And it was very clear that from the tone that I should not proceed with any further. So she was very curt? Yes. Okay. Um, did you any, receive any negative feedback based on this conversation? Over the next uh, month, I began to uh, receive counseling from Assistant Secretary Jones about my management style, things that uh, I basically was already doing on the ground, but nevertheless, I implemented everything that she asked me to do. Something that you were highly recommended and highly accommodated for, they are questioning it all of a sudden. Can I have the, uh, the, the video to be played on the screen, please? The fact is, we had four dead Americans. Was it because of a protest, or was it because of guys out for a walk one night who decided they'd go kill some Americans? What difference at this point does it make? It is our job to figure out what happened and do everything we can to prevent it from ever happening again. Well, I'm really mad, but Mr. Hicks, um, would you, could I give you the opportunity to respond to that question? Uh, what, do, what difference does it make? I think the question is, what difference did it make? Yep. Under Secretary, uh, President Magaryev uh, was insulted in front of his own people, in front of the world. His credibility was reduced. His ability to lead his own country was damaged. He was angry. A friend of mine who ate dinner with him in New York during the UN uh, season told me that he was still steamed about the, uh, the talk shows two weeks later. And I definitely believe that it negatively affected our ability to get the FBI team quickly to Benghazi. So that definitely impacted getting the FBI um, to look at the crime scene, did it not? Absolutely. So when you talked to the Libyan government, were they responsive um, when you asked about uh, access for the FBI? It was a long slog of 17 days to get 
the FBI team to Benghazi, working with various ministries to get ultimately agreement to support that visit to get them to Benghazi. But we accomplished that mission. Uh, but again, at the highest levels of the government, there was never really a, uh, a positive approval. So this, this, this false labeling was, a, was a, to a spontaneous reaction to a video, was a direct contravention of the explanation offered by this President, the President of Libya. And the facts on the ground impact our ability to investigate the crime scene afterward. How long was it, as you said, um, before the FBI was allowed um, access into Benghazi to examine that, that crime scene? 17 days. 17 days. Was the crime scene secured during that time? No, it was not. We so, repeatedly asked the government of Libya to secure the crime scene and prevent interlopers, but they were unable to do so. So let me get the time, timeline finalized here. So the FBI is sitting in Tripoli for weeks, waiting for the approval of the Libyan government to travel to Benghazi. Is that appropriate? Well, they were attempting to do their job from, from Tripoli as best they could. But they were, uh, they were denied access into Benghazi, right? Correct. So what were they doing with their time? They were interviewing witnesses that uh, they could find in Tripoli and could meet with in Tripoli. And they were also engaging with the government in order to develop a cooperative investigation with the Libyans who had sent an, investigative team, an investigator to Benghazi. Were you in, interviewed by the FBI? No, I was never interviewed by the FBI. Never? Hmm. Nice story. I yield back my time. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Nevada, Mr. Horsford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to our witnesses for being here. And, you know, it's my understanding that we've had uh, nine oversight hearings on Benghazi since the horrific attacks on our consulate on September 11, 2012. And like many of my colleagues have expressed to the family, I believe that we uh, need to continue uh, to do everything within our power as Congress uh, to get to the solutions and the recommendations that will prevent, them, uh, prevent this from happening again. And I think that in addition to our condolences, uh, the things that we need to do most is our job uh, to come up with the recommendations uh, to, to prevent this. One of the overall conclusions of the Accountability Review Board was just that, quote, that Congress must do its part to meet this challenge and provide necessary resources to the State Department to address security risks and meet mission imperatives. That was a direct uh, statement out of the, the review board recommendation. And I think each of you agree uh, that Congress must do its part. Am I correct? Yes or no? Real quick. Yes. So, you know, Mr. Chairman, I just would hope that after this hearing, after nine oversight hearings, that we will begin to work on some specific recommendations that we can bring forward and that all of us working together uh, can do our job to protect our embassies. I think that's what the public wants. I believe and hope that that's what the families want in the memory and the legacy of those who lost their lives. And I would say that it does cost money. Uh, Mr. Nordstrom, I know you say it, it's not just about money, but it also is about properly prioritizing budget considerations. And, you know, in the past, you know, my colleagues on the other side have not been willing uh, to make the kinds of serious and sustained commitments to funding that are necessary uh, for large-scale and long-term security projects like building facility improvements, for example. Would, would the gentleman yield uh, briefly? May, may I? Of course. Thank you. And so in both the 2011 and 2012 uh, budget cycles, uh, the, the, the budgets gave the State Department hundreds of millions of dollars less than what was requested. The fiscal year 2013 budget as proposed by the other side proposed even more cuts 
They want to reduce international affairs budget by more than $5 billion less than it was in fiscal year 12. That is a 9.8 percent cut to diplomatic security when extrapolated across the whole foreign affairs budget. By the fiscal year 2016, the proposed budget by the other side further cuts funding to international affairs by another $5 billion. This represents a 20 percent cut to diplomatic security when extrapolated over the entire foreign uh, affairs budget. So these are serious and significant cuts, and we cannot pretend that they don't have consequences. And so I know that my colleagues have talked several times about holding people accountable. Well, I hope that one of those groups that we will hold accountable are ourselves, as members of Congress, to do our job to properly fund the safety of our embassies so that this never happens again. I urge my Republican counterparts to work with us in a bipartisan effort to actually, to actually fund these improvements to our embassy security and to follow through on the 29 ARB recommendations that have already been made and those that we believe should also be supported from this hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We now go to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Meehan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I note for the record that Charlene Lamb, who testified before this committee at a previous time, was asked specifically the question as to whether or not funding issues uh, impacted uh, the actions that took place, and she said no. So, but, uh, and I'm really intrigued at this point in time by some of the commentary, because one of the things I would like to follow up on the questioning, Mr. Nordstrom, of, uh, that came to you from Mr. Langford uh, with regard to some of the decisions that were made, because uh, being in Benghazi, having the secretary, because I am going to tell you, I am struggling to find out how we had a United States ambassador in a marginally safe American compound in an increasingly hostile area on an iconic day like September 11th with limited security. And I think that there are some issues that you were talking about first decisions that were made about allowing occupancy in the first place. Could you tell me quickly about how that was enabled to be approved? Uh, that is the same question I still have to this day. You do not know, but you do know, according to the law, it appears that it must be signed off by the Secretary of State and there is no delegation. Certainly for parts of it, yes, for the, for the SECA portion of it. Following up, on July 31st, it is a fact that there were, I go back on the record, there were 16 SSTs, actually special forces in Libya, 14 Department of State security personnel. On August 31st, just shortly before, that had been reduced to six regulation individuals in Tripoli, three in Benghazi. Why the cutback on security? Again, that is one of the, the questions that I had. I have never seen it addressed in the ARB or anything else, is why were these decisions that we made uh, turned down? Why were, in fact, there was a proposal that went back all the way to uh, a month after we had arrived asking for $2.1 million uh, for staffing to have 19 DS agents maintained throughout that time period. I still don't have any understanding as what happened to that proposal. That went to the Under Secretary of Management as Did part of Did you have Rome. confidence in the ability of the, uh, the locals in the country who were purportedly designed to, to provide security for you? Did you have confidence in their ability to provide that? I think, to put it succinctly, it was uh, the best bad plan. Um, it was the only thing we had. It was the only thing, but I didn't ask if it wanted. So did you have confidence in that? No. Did you report that at any point in time to officials in Washington, D.C.? We did. We did uh, note the training deficiencies in particular. That was something that was always there. Uh, certainly, we had also raised the issue of doing some sort of counterintelligence vetting um, of the people that worked for us. Uh, ultimately, uh, that was turned down, even though we wanted it because the Department of State wanted Post to pay the, the funds for it, which we didn't have. It had always been under our understanding that that was going to be paid for by Washington. Thank you. So. Mr. Thompson, I, I, I know that you have 
background in counterterrorism. I'm going back on this is, this is testimony that was provided by Lieutenant Colonel Wood, who was an SST person doing service in Tripoli and ultimately wanted to be in Benghazi. He talked about Facebook threats that were made about Western influences in Benghazi. I also note then a series of issues, an RPG attack on the Red Cross in early May, a Red Cross second attack in June, an IED attack against the uh, UN mission in April 6, an IED attack against a UN convoy on April 10, an assassination attempt on the British ambassador in June 11 with RPGs, an attempted carjacking on August 6 of two SST officers of the United States. In your mind, does this, in your professional opinion, would this suggest to you that the facility in Benghazi by a reasonable person with your experience or a reasonable person in the State Department would be likely to be considered a possible or even likely target of a terrorist incident? It, it certainly uh, had all the uh, indicators of that based on that, that history. Yes, Congressman. And in light of that, and in light of your experience at Mr. Nordstrom's testimony, would you have been happy with the idea that it was allowed to be maintained under less than the staffing that had existed only a month before or two months before and under standards which were only two in the entire country, according to the testimony of Mr. Nordstrom, that were not meeting the requirements, the minimal requirements of safety? No, sir. Doesn't make Mr. Nordstrom or Mr. Hicks, what is normalization and why were we doing this? That's, that's been a question that even that the IRB uh, raised and others have raised. Uh, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, uh, sarcastically, we, we saw it as do more with less. But uh, that I first saw that, that term, normalization, uh, in that budget proposal, a resource proposal, a month after we had arrived. There was already talk about normalizing our footprint. It was then picked up again in February when, the, uh, when Greg's uh, predecessor had met with Das Lamb. Same thing. Uh, it, it struck me as being part of some sort of script, um, just like the reason why he didn't close the, the facility in Benghazi despite the risks. There was already a political decision that said we're going to keep that open. That's fine, but no one's ever come out and said that, that we made that risk and we made that decision uh, and, and take, a, take a responsibility for it. I think the gentleman. My, my time's my, expired, but Mr. Hicks, did you have a, an answer, a response to that as well? Normalization to us was moving towards being like a normal embassy instead of having, uh, being in a sense uh, under siege or in a, in a hostile environment where we're surrounded by potential threats. And we wanted to move towards normal life, and it also meant removing or, or a withdrawal of extra DS personnel uh, and, and then the movement towards our diplomatic security personnel managing more of a, of a program that included the recruitment of Libyans to provide additional sec the, the security that we needed. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Hicks, you, you mentioned earlier your, your wife being such an important part of your decision process. Were you planning on bringing her to Libya since it was normalized? Uh, just, Mr. Chairman, thanks. Uh, just to correct, I, I was actually selected to be DCM by Assistant Secretary for Near Eastern Affairs, Jeff Feltman, in, in Tripoli. Uh, Jeff and I spent a lot of time in the 2006 war in Lebanon together. Yeah. He's a good man. Yeah. But, uh, but, but when, as, as to family returning to Libya, I mean, normalization means you bring back dependents right. and so on. Was that part of what was going on? That's what we, that's what we were pointing towards, in fact. Uh, and, and Chris and I had a long talk on the night of uh, September 9th before he left for Benghazi. And we, we talked about this, that, that we felt optimistic about the trajectory, that even though all of these security problems were going on, we felt that the Libyans were getting their political act together. They were going to pull together a government. They were going to get a constitution. The co their economy was going to pick up. They were going to stabilize. And my next project 
was in fact to reach out to the board members of the American School and start working with them about the possibility of opening the school in September. And that would, of course, allowed me to bring my family to join me in, in Tripoli. And that was actually a condition that my wife made for my going to my second unaccompanied assignment. Uh, in, uh, so. I'm sure she's glad to have you home now, though. Yes, she's very glad to have me home. With, with that, we go to the gentleman from New Mexico who has been patiently waiting. Oh, I'm sorry. Who, who's next? Mr. Cardenas, next. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, my condolences to all the families and everybody who suffered from this tragedy. And uh, also, I, I hope that you pray for us that we do the right thing uh, as policy makers and not as politicians. Um, Mr. Nordstrom, um, you have stated here that you felt the security situation in Benghazi was unsafe. Uh, as a matter of fact, you have been very clear on placing blame with a number of people. So given everything that was going on at the time and everything you have said today and what you said on October 10th, at any point did you suggest to Ambassador Stevens that he should not travel to Benghazi on uh, September 11th anniversary? and that the situation was volatile and that the facility, uh, per your own assessment, was not secure? I had departed post on 26th of July, so I didn't have the opportunity to, to do that. Um, I, I would defer that to the RSO that was there at the time, John Martinek. Um, I, it's my understanding that he also had raised some concerns and discussed that. So you have your opinions today, but you did not have those same opinions back then? I, I wasn't at post. Okay. For, for September 11th. I had departed six weeks prior. So, uh, If the gentleman uh, would indulge, I think he is asking, were you, what was your opinion on the day you left relative to Benghazi? Oh, okay. I understand. Um, I had actually met with the, with the ambassador prior uh, to that as part of an out briefing, um, and he and I talked about kind of the way forward uh, and the threats in the East. Uh, were something that we talked about. Uh, I had mentioned that in, in October as well. Um, it was very concerning to us, uh, the, the increase in, in the targeting. It was something that I had mentioned back uh, to our headquarters in, in reporting. Uh, it was something that the Ministry of Interior brought up. Uh, when the ambassador went and met with the minister in July uh, to talk about requesting static security, they highlighted, number one, growing extremism in the East, particularly in Benghazi, and Derna, and CERT. Um, so absolutely, that was something that, that we discussed. Um, and we were concerned in particular that, that we were not getting the resources. So uh, you stressed that, that you did stress concerns, but not to the point where you said, I wouldn't go if I were you, or you uh, We go. never had that discussion, uh, in part because the ambassador had not uh, indicated any sort of uh, desire to travel to Benghazi. Um, it, my hope would, would have been that they would have had resources there to, to augment any such travel. Okay. And, and resources require other kinds of resources. I mean, if you have resources on the ground, they require actual funding, et cetera. There is a balance to creating the kind of atmosphere and security that would be uh, required to meet any concerns, correct? Sure. In, in what we were looking at is that you were going to have a, a downsizing of personnel um, in, in Tripoli. So any time the ambassador would have traveled, uh, that would have impacted security in both locations because you would have been splitting up resources, um, which is what I think ultimately happened. Mr. Hicks, uh, can you shed some light on this discussion that we are having? In the two planning meetings that we had for Ambassador Stevens' trip to Benghazi, uh, Regional Security Officer John Martinek raised con serious concerns about his travel. Uh, because of those concerns, the ambassador adjusted his plans for that trip. First, he, he agreed that he would go in a low-profile way. His trip would not be announced in advance. We would not do any planning of meetings until right before he went. Uh, and. Uh, second, he eventually decided also to shorten his trip. He initially had planned to go on the 8th. He went on the 10th instead to narrow the time frame that he would be in Tripoli. The third step that he took was the one public event that he planned would take place at the very end of his trip just before he left. Okay. 
So, so basically, um, you are describing what I feel to be consistent. What I have um, known of the Ambassador is that he was very, very committed. Um, he did listen to advice, et cetera, but he was very determined and he continued to do his job. Exactly. He went there to do his job. He felt that he had a political imperative to go to Benghazi and represent the United States there in order to move the project forward to make ben, uh, the Benghazi consulate a permanent constituent post. Okay. Um, I, I'm, I'm so proud of his commitment and it, that is very consistent with everybody who has come across him. I just hope that we can have that commitment up here as elected officials to do the right thing so this never happens again. Thank you so much. Thank you. We now go to the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Desjardins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, today's hearing is about one thing, one simple thing. It is finding the truth. And uh, I know these families here want the truth, and I know the American people want the truth. But yet, I listened to this questioning today, and there seems to be a real partisan feel to, to finding the truth, and I don't understand that. I mean, we are, if you, if you listen to the other side, you would think it is time just to move on from this. They would agree with Secretary Clinton, right, that they would just say, what difference does it make? Well, some of the family members I talked to before this hearing, I guarantee this hearing makes a difference today. Uh, we want to know who made some of these decisions and why they made some of these decisions. The only encouraging part that I heard from the other side is that they feel that you all should be protected. Your ability to testify here and your desire to testify here should be protected. So that's good. And I want you to know I really appreciate you all being here. It really it does matter. It matters to a lot of people. Uh, Mr. Hicks, uh, after your visit uh, with Congressman Chaffet, or Ch Congressman Chaffet's visit, did you feel any kind of shift in the way you were treated? Yes, uh, again, uh, I did. When uh, Assistant Secretary Jones visited shortly after, when sh prior to the, the visit, Assistant Secretary Jones had visited and she pulled me aside and again said, uh, said I needed to improve my management style and, and indicated that people were upset. Uh, I had had no indication that my staff was upset at all, other than with the conditions that we were facing. Uh, following uh, my return to the United States, I attended Chris's funeral in San Francisco, and then I came back to Washington. Assistant Secretary Jones summoned me to her office, and she delivered a, a blistering critique of my uh, management style. And she uh, sa even said, I exclaimed, I don't know why Larry Pope would want you to come back. And she said she didn't even understand why anyone at Tripoli would want me to come back. Um, okay. um, but yet, right after the attack and before the attack, you had all kinds of praise for your leadership. You got a call from Secretary Clinton. You got a call from the President praising you for your service and how you handled things. Was there a seminal moment in your mind to when uh, all this praise and appreciation turned into something else? In hindsight, I think it began after I asked the question about Ambassador Rice's testimony, uh, statement on, on the TV shows. Mm -hmm. And you know, anyone listening to this hearing today, if they don't have questions, I mean, there was some comment made about, well, there was a few people in Libya that had a problem with this YouTube video. But the overwhelming evidence is that this was a, a terrorist attack. Everybody knew it. But yet someone higher up decided to run with this story, this facade, and they kept it for a long time. And I would think that everyone sitting here wants to know the answer why uh, that was done. So what other impediments have you had or how, how have you felt since deciding to come forward? Do you feel like uh, they have treated you any differently uh, from that point on? Well, uh, after I was angry with the way uh, I had been criticized, I thought it was unfounded. I felt like I had been tried and convicted in absentia. And, uh, but I decided I was going to try to, I was going to go back and try to redeem myself uh, in, in what, what is your job right now? What is uh, my job? I am a foreign affairs air officer in the Office of Global Intergovernmental Affairs. Okay, a far cry from where you were in your level of capabilities. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, so when you came back to the United States, were you planning on going back to Libya? I was. I fully intended to do so. And what do you think happened? Based on the, the criticism that I received, I felt that if I went back, I would never uh, be comfortable working there. Mm -hmm. And in addition, my family 
really didn't want me to go back. We'd endured a year of separation when I was in Afghanistan in 2006 and 2007, and that was the overriding factor. So I uh, voluntarily curtailed. I accepted an offer of what's called a no-fault curtailment. Uh, that means that there's, there, there would be no uh, criticism of, of my departure or post, no negative repercussions. And in fact, uh, Ambassador Pope, when he made the offer to everyone in, in Tripoli when he arrived, I mean, Charge Pope, when he arrived, um, he indicated that people could expect that they would get a, a good onward assignment out of that. All right. Well, thank you. I, I would just close with the fact that, you know, we have a president that's made it his policy since he took office not to knee-jerk or jump to conclusions when it comes to some tragedy or event. But yet, why did he do it in this case? Why was he quick to jump to the conclusion that this was a protest due to a YouTube video? I think we all know that's not true, and I think we all need to find the answer to that. Thank, uh, thank you. And, and could, could I, Of just, course. Could I just clarify? The, the job that I have right now, between my curtailment and my finding of this job that I have now, I had no meaningful employment. Um, I was in a status called Near Eastern Affairs over complement, and uh, the job now is a significant, it's a demotion. Foreign Affairs Officer is a, is a designation that is given to our civil service colleagues who, funct who are desk officers. So, it's a so I've been effectively demoted from Deputy Chief of Mission to desk officer. Uh, let me just uh, interject one thing at this time. Uh, in your opening statement, I note, and it's already in the record, but uh, I want to make sure that it's separately placed in at this moment, uh, you, uh, you included an unclassified document uh, purported to be from the President of the United States to the President of Libya. Is that correct? Yes. I want to be very careful. Uh, it doesn't have a signature. It's, uh, it looks like it was electronically transmitted. It's a cable. This cable, was it, as far as you know, from the President of the United States directly? Yes. And was it delivered to the President of Libya directly? It was. And does it mention terrorist attack anywhere else? And I would note that this is September 17th which would be that Monday afterwards. Do, uh, does this, in your opinion, in any way, shape, or form, describe the unfortunate circumstances as terrorism to the President of Libya? I, I believe it does. Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes. I, 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 I don't even it's know. In, it's, in, it's in his opening statement. It was delivered to everybody. Okay. Uh, these are inclusions. Uh, but uh, it says, thank you for responding quickly to the tragic attack in Benghazi. And I'm reading through this thing, uh, uh, you know, uh, and uh, well, I, it's in the record, but I, as far as I can tell, uh, it speaks of it as a tragic attack. It doesn't speak to it even after Secretary or Ambassador Rice spoke. It doesn't speak to it as a terrorist attack or our war on terror or fighting terrorism. Is that correct? Yeah, I don't have it before me at this point, at this moment. Okay, we'll deliver it back to you just to make sure someone may want to follow up and oh, your counsel has it for you. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it says outrageous attack. Okay, so it's an outrageous attack, but it doesn't talk about us working together to fight terrorism, does it? No. Okay. Thank you for including that in the record. We now go to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Farrell. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I would like to uh, also uh, join my colleagues on both sides of the aisle in expressing our condolences to the families of Ambassador Stevens, uh, Sean Smith, Tyrone Wood, and Glenn Doherty, and all of those others injured. I want to quickly uh, clear up just a couple of loose ends from earlier, uh, earlier testimony, and then I want to ask a couple of questions about the February 17th Martyr Brigade. But first off, Mr. Hicks, you, you've testified on numerous uh, occasions that you never got a chance to read the classified ARB report. You do have uh, security clearance that uh, you sat in with the meeting with Mr. Chaffetz that your minder couldn't uh, attend. So you do have security clearance? Yes, sir. Uh, all right. And then, Mr. Thompson, uh, you testified in answer to the uh, question as to why um, the FEST team, uh, the, your response team was not uh, deployed. Uh, the, uh, one of the things you heard was it might not be to a safe location. Do you guys train to deploy to Canada or the Caribbean islands or other safe locations, or are you uh, trained to respond to hot spots? Hot spots. Uh, and you don't, would there have been any reluctance on the part of you or any uh, of the men or women in uh, your organization to uh, go to Libya or anywhere in the world that you were needed to protect Americans? 
um, I, um, I hang out with a very noble and brave crowd? The answer is no. I didn't think so. And then, uh, Mr. Hicks, I want to talk uh, a little bit about what was going on in, um, in Libya at the time. There had just been a revolution. We had a newly elected uh, president, democratically uh, elected. Uh, we were involved uh, through, our, through our NATO partners uh, in, in that. This was a, probably a win for the United States. We had a friendly government, a relatively friendly government uh, going in. And then uh, we all but make the uh, new president out to, we, we throw him under the bus on the Sunday shows. Uh, and you testify that that may have been one of the reasons the FBI was slow getting in. Did it, do you think it uh, overall damaged our relationship beyond that with Libya? It complicated things for that period of time, I think, particularly with respect to the FBI mission. But the Libyan people, as a poll released by Gallup right before 9-11 attests, uh, valued our relationship highly. In fact, higher than almost any other Arab country. It was over 50 percent of the population. And isn't that one of the reasons Ambassador Stevens went to uh, Benghazi uh, on that fateful day, is to continue to show uh, our support for what was going on in Libya at the time? Absolutely, especially to the people of Benghazi. All right. Now, I want to go on. Uh, there have been some reports floating around. Can you, uh, Mr. Nordstrom, can you tell me uh, what the role of the February 17th Martyrs Brigade was in protecting the consulate uh, in Benghazi? Uh, certainly. That was the, the unit, for lack of a better term, uh, that was provided to us by the Libyan government. Now, were, you, were you aware of any ties uh, of that militia to Islamic extremists? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, we, we had that uh, discussion. Uh, on a number of occasions, um, the last of which was when there was a Facebook uh, posting uh, of a threat um, that named Ambassador Stevens and, and Senator McCain, who was coming out for the elections. That was in the jo July time frame. Uh, I had met with uh, some of my agents and then also with some annex personnel. Um, we discussed, uh, discussed that. And Mr. Hicks, uh, you were in Libya on the night of the attack. Do you believe the uh February 17th uh, militia uh, played a role in those attacks, was complacent in those attacks? Certainly elements of that militia were complicit in the attacks. The attackers had to make a long approach march through multiple checkpoints that were manned by February, February 17 militia. Uh, all right. Now, I, okay. I'm going to, Mr. Hicks and Mr. Nortzer, I'm going to ask you both this question. I mean, I'm stunned that the State Department was relying on a militia with extremist ties to protect uh, American diplomats. That, that, that doesn't make any sense. How does that happen? You mean like in Afghanistan where Afghanis that are uh, working with our military that are embedded and turn on them uh, and shoot them? Or uh, Yemen, our, our embassy was attacked in 2008 by attackers wearing police uh, uniforms, or in uh, Saudi Arabia in Jeddah, we had an attack in 2004. The Saudi National Guard that was protecting our facility uh, reportedly ran from the scene, and then it took 90 minutes before we could get help. Yeah, um, pretty high unemployment in <laughs> the United States. I would imagine there are some people that would be willing to take it, Americans that would be willing to take I, I, jobs overseas. We, we couldn't agree with you more, uh, but unfortunately, as I said earlier, one of the things that, that we ran into, that was the best bad plan. That was the unit that uh, the Libyan government had initially designated for VIP protection. Um, well, I, I it was very difficult that, to extract ourselves from that. I certainly hope that these hearings will result in us not having to rely on the best of bad plans, and we can use folks like Mr. Thompson and his group for what they were uh, intended and, uh, and secure our personnel. I see I'm out of time, Mr. Chairman. Only by a little. We now go to the distinguished gentleman from the great state of Washington, the chairman of the Resources Committee, Mr. Hastings. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And let me add my uh, voice to all of my colleagues that uh, thank you for your service. I think while we all say it, it should, probably should go without saying it, but nevertheless, uh, we, we really do appreciate that. Mr. Uh, Hicks, I want to follow up. Uh, you may have answered this, and so I just want to get a clarification, because Mr. Jordan was entering into questions regarding the lawyer that came in and was not allowed to go to the meeting because of wasn't uh, uh, qualified to go to that meeting. My, my question specifically is to back up. The State Department sent this lawyer. Were you told why the lawyer was sent? He was sent to participate in all the meetings 
and all events associated with Congressman Chaffetz's visit. Okay. Did you find that unusual? Uh, I never had occurred before in my career. Okay. But, but they did, the State Department did say that this lawyer was going to come and participate in all of the meetings. Yes. You were told that. And then, of course, they couldn't because of the protocols. Uh, you mentioned that the um, tone of the State Department has related to you changed after, probably after the Rice interview. It began to change. Yes. Yeah. Uh, explain, just give us some examples of how things changed. Uh, again, I began to uh, have my management style counseled by Assistant Secretary Jones. Uh, when she visited, she again uh, counseled me on my management style and said staff was upset. I had had no s indication of staff being upset. Uh, and then again, when I returned to Washington, she delivered a very uh, blistering critique of my style and again said, exclaimed, I don't know why Larry Pope would want you back. Uh, well, let me, that, that leads to a very obvious question then. Prior to September 10th, 2012, had you received any negative feedback from your superiors? Uh, no. Uh, Chris and I had, devel had developed a very positive relationship. We, uh, he trusted me, I trusted him, and we were working together very, very well, and the people, morale was high. Well, I suppose in a, in a career as long as yours, you might have some disagreement with your superiors. Was it to the extent that you have uh, felt that you were treated after, uh, after this event last September compared to prior maybe dis disagreements you may have with your uh, superiors? Uh, I, I guess never, on, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the worst, 10. and uh, you, you were ten a after. Okay. All right. I've, that, that's, uh, I guess that's what I would, would like to uh, uh, wanted to follow up on. Um, you mentioned that you feel in the job you have, you, uh, it's really a demotion from the qualifications that you have had in your career in the, in the service. Have you um, talked to any of your colleagues or any senior leaders within the State Department regarding this? And if so, what, uh, what was that, those conversations all about? I, uh, <clears throat> I spoke with, uh, well, after a couple of friends who have outside the department intervened with senior officials about my situation, um, the, uh, the Deputy Secretary Burns and the Director General said that my, I would be taken care of. Uh, same thing that Larry Pope had indicated. And so I met with uh, the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary um, for Human Resources, Hans Clem, and I talked to him about what options might be available to me. Um, and Basically, the answer was I ha would have to go through the formal, normal bidding process for assignments and persuade someone that I should be hired. Uh, and then uh, the conversation with Deputy Secretary Burns was centered around uh, discussions I'd had with the leadership of our embassy in Mexico City about the head of the political section job there, which would be a very uh, good job. Uh, but, and he said that he would support that, but I had to go through the process. And it's a very long process since the position, that position is at a higher grade. Well, let, let, let me ask you this. I, uh, going through the process, and I understand there's protocols, but would that strike you as unusual as somebody with your background and the position that you had uh, uh, in Libya and, and other areas? I was surprised that, that I was having to go through the process, the normal process. Okay. That's and especially when amba the ambassador in Mexico City had talked to Deputy Secretary Burns about bringing me on as his political counselor. Well, I heard my colleagues uh, on the other side of the aisle say that if there's any retribution, that's my words, not your words, any retribution on this, that you will have full support of your colleagues. Uh, let me lend uh, my support and I think support of everybody here. Uh, I think a bipartisan support on somebody that comes forth that has a difference of agreement on a very, on a policy issue or a decision that kill four Americans deserve to uh, have uh, whatever uh, we can give to you. So thank you very much and I see my time has expired. Well, and the time that we can ask witnesses.